of your time. What does monetary policy, in theory at least, suggest? Look, the, uh, the whole idea of how central banks affect, uh, affect inflation is uh, by curbing demand. And uh, that's one. Second is that monetary policy acts with long and variable lags. That's another tenet of monetary policy, which means that if you change interest rates today, they have an effect on demand eight, 12 months down the line. Typically in India, we found at least three to four quarters. So uh, what you have to be doing is forecasting what happens to the economy a few quarters down the line. And so, because you're forecasting, and forecasting is very difficult, as you know, uh, you try and use all the data you have uh, uh, before making decisions, and you're trying to predict the future. So it's, uh, it's, it's a tough job, uh, and that's why I've said we, we typically wait for all the data to come in before making decisions. But uh, if I can move away from monetary policy to our macroeconomic fundamentals, is the improvement that we are seeing, is it real, is it sustainable, is it contrived because of administrative measures like the restrictions on you know, gold import? No, I, I think we have seen a lot of improvement on some dimensions. I think on the current account deficit we've brought it down considerably. Uh, of course the last month gold picked up, uh, but you must remember this is the month before the festival season. Um, in general, uh, even though our exports seem to have, uh, have slowed down, you must remember the price of oil has come down also. Uh, we do export a lot of oil products and therefore there's an artificial way when the price of oil comes down, our exports also come down. Similarly with the price of gold, jewelry exports also come down. When you look at non-oil, non-gold uh, exports, they're still doing reasonably well. Uh, six to seven percent growth and uh, that's one of the strengths of the economy over the last few months. Uh, we're seeing some pickup in industrial growth. Again there's some salient numbers distort the figures. For example, I'm told Nokia shut down its uh, plant in Chennai and that made a big difference to the IIP numbers. So we have to look through all that noise. I think the bottom line is we do seem to be picking up in growth our current account deficit is smaller and of course the inflation numbers look a lot healthier than they looked a few months ago. So are we improving? Yes we are and hopefully we will see more sustainable growth going forward. Where we have to do the most work mm -hmm. is on getting the growth uh, to be supported in a, in a strong way and uh, you know we still have work to do on the financial side, on the real side there. Uh, well, I respect your issue, desire not to be questioned on the domestic monetary policy, but surely you won't mind commenting on the U.S. Fed's monetary policy. So what are you expecting to see over there, and how are we going to tackle it when, as and when Janet Yellen decides that she's going to raise interest rates? Well, even there I have to be careful. I can't be seen commenting too much on... But they uh, wouldn't care, well, but I, 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 <laughs> what you still, said. I'll, I'll tell you. Well, they do care because do they... they uh, do you get that uh, sense that they want Yeah, yeah, central okay. bankers pay attention to what other people say. Even third world countries. Even third world countries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, see, the, the real issue uh, across the world is how effective is quantitative easing. Not in its first round. The first round of quantitative easing was repairing markets in the US. It was repairing markets in, in the euro area. Remember, uh, they were trying to um, you know, deal with uh, sovereign debt markets which had gone haywire in Europe. In the US, the mortgage markets had broken down. I think QE as applied there, often it's called credit easing, mm -hmm. is effective. When you move beyond that to uh, trying to affect uh, long-term interest rates and thereby mm -hmm. affect activity, uh, there's a lot more question about how effective it is. And what I've been arguing in international fora is that the main mm -hmm. effect may not come through activity and interest rates and activity, but may come by depreciating your own exchange rate. Okay. So what you saw is that uh, while Japan, the UK and the US had extremely aggressive policies uh, on quantitative easing, the euro didn't, euro area didn't, and the euro area strengthened quite a bit despite having very weak growth.
Now that the euro area has joined the bandwagon, even while the U.S. is moving out, the U.S. currency has strengthened while the euro area currency has weakened. And you hear now, yesterday, John Williams from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco said, maybe we should go in for QE4. That suggests that, you know, some policymakers in the United States are getting worried mm -hmm. about the strength of the U.S. currency. My concern is that there is no easy exit. Okay. Once you've got in, mm -hmm. what goes up when you come, uh, go in will come down when you get out. And if you're scared about the volatility, well, maybe we shouldn't have gotten in the first place. <laughs> but now that we're here, we, I mean, I, I would hope that as the U.S. economy strengthens, the U.S. in a calibrated and transparent fashion moves to exit. And what about the defense mechanism for countries like India? What kind of defense mechanism can we have? I mean, I think there will be some volatility uh, when we are, uh, when countries are exiting, but they have to. And uh, for countries like India, my hope is that we've built enough credibility okay. in financial markets that we will have some volatility for a little while. But once the uh, first wave of selling uh, sort of abates, people will look around and say, uh, which country looks better? Where can you find the kind of investment opportunities that you have in India? And again, there are lots of low-hanging fruit that we can pluck. When we pluck them, that is, clear the way for, uh, for investments to happen. I am confident that we should grow very strongly. Okay, Governor, I won't stand between you and the students because they're very eager to kind of ask you questions. But one just la this kind of outreach that you had, you'd once spoken about, you know, saying having glamour introduced into pro a profession does, in, you know, enthuse youngsters to join supposedly dull professions like central banking. So is this outreach program part of your effort to step out of the ivory tower, get youngsters to make think central banking is glamorous? Well, it's not so much glamorous as, as worthwhile. I hope uh, when you see my colleagues and I hope you interact with some of them, I mean, this is a, a very important task. Uh, many people think we, have, uh, we are the secret uh, power agency in the world, the group of central bankers. Hopefully that, uh, that attracts a number of people. But really, uh, it's uh, you know, maintaining the value of a nation's currency uh, trying to uh, undertake policies that expand access to finance, that promote financial development. Uh, you know, where else can you do it uh, with the freedom uh, uh, that, that one can have than in a central bank? So, yeah, the, the sound bite is uh, of the, uh, you know, come join the uh, Reserve Bank. We won't pay you too much. Uh, uh, but we'll give you a, a great experience. The um, unfortunate part, of course, is that, uh, or fortunate or unfortunate, is that we can't recruit on campus. But we have an exam. Uh, I'm told that uh, you know smart people like you should do very well in the exam. And after that, uh, I hope you will be enthusiastic about joining us. You spoke of freedom, Governor. I won't pin you down by asking you, well, how much freedom do you really have under this government, under the previous government? We need that open. But with that, the floor is open. And I think we have a number of questions. In fact, there were so many. So I really basically had to short list. And I think the first question is somebody called Sai Priya Kamath. If she's somewhere here, can you please ask? Can people hear in the back? So the RBI is the Monetary Policy Authority of India and also the Merchant Banker of the government. So these two roles are in conflict. So how does RBI manage this conflict? Okay, so the question is RBI is, uh, determines monetary policy and is also the Merchant Banker for the government. So isn't there a conflict between these policies? Uh, not if you manage your, uh, your policies reasonably. So. Um, uh, we do an, a certain amount of business for the government. We sort of sell the government's debt, for example. But we are constrained not to buy the government's debt directly. That way we don't finance the government. Uh, there are uh, ways one could argue that the uh, Reserve Bank of India does, in fact, uh, send money to the government. We send a big dividend. This year it was 52,500 crores. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that all that money is sloshing around 
in the system and thereby inhab inhibits our monetary policy function. We also suck out some of that money by doing, say, open market operations or selling uh, government debt back into the market. So we determine what we do on the monetary side separately from what we do as a uh, government's agent or as, the, um, um, a, as an entity that is effectively owned by the government. We try and make sure that monetary policy is not in any way affected by these other functions. Okay. Uh, the second question is from Rajni Kasu. Given your experience as a CEA, uh, which have you found most effective in the Indian scenario? Is it the monetary policy or uh, physical policy? That's the first part. The uh, second I'm, part I'm is... Sorry, I, given your experience as a... CEA, as the Chief CEA, Economic Advisor. Oh, Chief, Chief Economic Advisor. Which uh, hat do you find more? More, uh, more, I would say more effective in the, in the, in the Indian, Indian context. Fiscal or monetary, monetary policy? Monetary policy or the physical policy? Okay. And the second part is our interest rates I mean, the way we are changing the interest rate, is, uh, that, is that a blunt tool for monetary policy or is there any other better way to do that? Okay. So, um, on the issue of whether fiscal or monetary is more effective, I would say both are necessary. Uh, you have to clap with both hands. And uh, I think it's extremely important what the government has done in terms of fiscal restraint, uh, both the previous government as well as this government in, uh, in uh, setting the course for a reduction in the fiscal deficit that has been extremely important and the fact that they've actually constrained spending uh, is, is part of why we see lower inflation. I also believe that monetary policy has played a role in uh, uh, you know, uh, ameliorating uh, expectations not just of the lay public which I think are harder to affect in, in the short time but of bond market participants, of analysts many of whom are now convinced that we will hit a 6% target by the end of next year. So uh, I think both are necessary uh, and uh, one can't function without the other. The central bank can't do its job if the government does not cooperate and vice versa. Um, the second On question interest rate policy was, being uh, a blunt interest, instrument. Interest rates are a blunt instrument, of course they're a blunt instrument. But if you could give me some other policies that, uh, that would work, I would be happy. Right? I mean, uh, so uh, I think uh, we have to live with the fact that we have a blunt instrument. And uh, the instrument works, let me admit frankly, works by constraining growth below where it would otherwise be. But if you have supply which is constrained and demand uh, which exceeds supply, which is causing inflation, which is I think generally how inflation is caused, you have to bring demand and supply back into, into a match. I think, Governor, you might get some bright ideas from ISB, but I think the question really was, we were talking to the students earlier, because you've been trying to signal that it should not be lowered, but banks are successively cutting their interest rates. So where is monetary transmission? You want to keep interest rates high, you as in the RBI, and banks are successively sending a signal that interest rates should come down, bond yields are coming down. So I think that really was the dilemma that the students were, you know, a little puzzled about. No, so the Reserve Bank of India doesn't operate directly at the long end and we have no desire to try and fix the long end of interest rates. So there's a misconception sometimes that we are trying to determine what the long end of interest rates are. That's not uh, where we determine policy. We determine policy at the short end. We have set a policy rate of 8%. We are trying to, uh, with our new liquidity measures, which have been developing over time, uh, maintain the short-term interest rate at around 8% and we've been quite successful in the last few weeks at keeping it around there. Now, uh, uh, banks, some banks have been cutting their deposit rates in some segments. I don't see a uniform across the rate uh, fall and many are waiting for a sustained uh, signal that inflation is falling, that the central bank is going to turn. Uh, to transmit that into lending rates. I don't think lending rates have fallen. That's how we uh, control demand. And, uh, you know, uh, as and when uh, policy determines it. Uh, and the fall in the bond yields? 
the bond yields are okay. The okay. problem, the bond yields partly are signaling our success, okay. uh, success of the Reserve Bank, success of the government okay. in controlling inflation. Okay. After all, bond yields are over 10 years of, uh, okay. I mean, I think few would expect us to keep uh, interest rates high over the next 10 years. <laughs> I hope not. The next question is from Chaitanya Tarimela. Chaitanya is here? Yeah. <coughs> I'll repeat the question. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, question is, in the context of FSLRC, what is your opinion on the government's move to contain uh, curtail curtail R R RBI's independence? independence? And that hasn't come from me. It's not a plan. Yeah, yeah, it's not a plan. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah, I could have said this is uh, uh, journalists trying to uh, <laughs> no. prod me to uh, to react. You know, the truth is uh, the government and the Reserve Bank uh, enjoy, uh, you know, a free, frank and cordial relationship. Uh, we discuss many things and uh, we try and do what is in the best interest of the, of, of the country. And I think there's a discussion going on right now on a, a couple of things. Uh, one is, of course, a number of institutional structures that will improve the functioning of the financial sector. For example, a financial resolution authority. We really need a financial resolution authority so that we can close down financial institutions that get into trouble without necessarily merging them and taking up the losses and feeding them back into the system. We need to clean out institutions, close down you know, poorly functioning ones while uh, resurrecting uh, well-functioning ones. So the Financial Resolution Authority will, will be an entity doing that. Uh, but we also are uh, in discussion about a monetary policy framework. And the monetary pro policy framework, again, uh, this is a, a far-sighted move on the part of the government, is an attempt to move us to, uh, you know, standards where, which other countries have reached. It is going to be a discussion about how do we make the objectives of the central bank more explicit. I mean, one explicit objective could be a certain level of inflation or a certain band within inflation can move. Another objective, financial stability. A third objective could be growth, given that you meet the inflation objectives. So these are things that need to be discussed. Also, the items that would be discussed is how do you determine this process? Do you do, do it through a monetary policy committee? Who appoints the members of the Monetary Policy Committee? What is their term? What is the term of the uh, you know, management of the Reserve Bank? How do you ensure there's enough independence that the targets can be met, but at the same time the central bank is doing what is uh, determined by parliament or, or the government that is a representative of parliament? So these are issues that have to be discussed. I don't think that it immediately means there's a conflict between the bank and, and, and the government or that our independence is under threat. These are issues that, uh, that need to be worked out. Well, the next question is from Srinivas Reddy. Yeah, hi, Governor Rajan. Uh, the IMF has reported about the vulnerability of emerging market economies, right? And the key areas that they focused on were portfolio investment and capital markets, so uh, TOD, and what we as a country can do both from a central bank standpoint, as well as from an RBI standpoint. Uh, Look, uh, let's accept the fact that we are a country running current account deficits and that we are likely to run current account deficits for the foreseeable future. It's not a bad thing because we're letting foreign investors fund part of our investment, the part that our own savings cannot fund. Of course, we don't want to rely too much. If you start relying too much, you become vulnerable. But some reliance is not bad. Countries like Canada and Australia have run current account deficits for time immemorial as they funded their growth. So, so we can do a little bit. Now once you're reliant on foreign money, you have to ask, how can I bring it in most safely? And most people would say, bring it in in the form of FDI. That's wonderful, except you may not have that quantity of FDI to finance yourself. So we have to move to other forms of financing. Portfolio investment is a form of financing. Portfolio investment that goes into equities has been relatively stable. Only one year in the last eight or nine has have you seen a net outflow of equity. That was 2008. Generally, it has come in 
and investors are willing to stay longer. I think on the debt side, we've seen short-term debt is a little volatile. People come in and leave. Uh, and so we've been pushing the debt into the longer maturities, uh, especially as far as government debt goes. So yes, there will be some volatility in uh, foreign institutional or portfolio investment in debt. Uh, but you have to live a little bit with that. Uh, recognizing in the longer run is both useful for the liquidity in the markets but also for the fact that you have to net finance some foreign uh, some investment from abroad. Prasad Babu has got the next question. Uh, good evening. Uh, my question is on the infrastructure space now. Presently in the Indian sector a lot of projects are held up uh, because of the government clearance issues and most of these projects are not able to meet the two years time frame of RBI guidelines for commissioning the project. As far as these projects are going, turning into the NPI mode, which would affect the infrastructure space as well as the banking sector as a whole. Is RBI coming up with the policy guidelines to get over this issue or something is being done on this? So were you, are you planted by the bankers or the, <laughs> <laughs> or the promoters? <laughs> Look, uh, uh, good question. Uh, you have to first ask yourself what the RBI norms do when, I, when we have norms for NPA recognition. Fundamentally, they do two things. One, they force a recognition of a problem and signal to the world that there is a problem here and I'm admitting there's a problem, right? Second is they force some provisioning for that particular problem. Now, you have accounting professors sitting here, you have courses in accounting. Supposing you, you change the accounting treatment in a way that hides your problems, right? Does it mean that your investor, who's ultimately the one that you're worried about, does it mean that they give you a free pass, now you say everything is hunky-dory? Do they say that, yes, everything's hunky-dory? No, what they say is, I don't know. Because I don't know, because you've changed the accounting standards, your accounting is no longer transparent, I'm going to discount your shares even more because I don't know what you're tr truly doing, right? Uh, similarly, if you don't provision for bad debts that are going to come and you say, I won't, I'll do it when the time comes. Uh, what is going to happen? They say, they'll say your profits are not as rosy as you pretend they are. They're actually worse because you're not provisioning. Again, discount you. So the point that we have to ask is who are you fooling? If you change the norms for recognition of bad loans, etc., you're not fooling the uh, markets. You're not fooling the uh, you know the public. Uh, you're not fooling the investor. It may look rosy, but instead of calling it an NPA, you're calling it a restructured asset. Instead of calling restructured, you're calling it a performing asset. But basically, people say, "I don't know." The Reserve Bank has changed all the norms, and basically, can't be trusted accounting can't be trusted. So what I've been trying to say in public, say in, uh, in private to everybody is, uh, put lipstick on a pig, it doesn't turn into a princess. You cannot overnight turn your balance sheet into something smelling of roses simply by changing the NPA norms. In fact, what you'll do is create a lot more suspicion about your balance sheet. So don't keep saying we need forbearance. Instead, work on putting the asset back to work. And that means real sector changes. It means financial sector changes. It means restructuring the uh, loan profile. On all those, we have worked to give the financial sector more leeway. Right? So for example, if you want to restructure a loan, which uh, you, you said was eight years, the firm is paying, but you know, eight years is too short a time for a 30-year project. We've allowed the bank to now restructure it into a 30-year project, provided it can get somebody else to come in for 25% of the loan, just to certify this is not evergreening. Right? So we've done many things like this. I think putting the project back on track, allowing it to function in a better way, is better than just pushing the bad loan under the carpet and saying, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil. So when it comes to NPAs, the rose by any name doesn't work, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, the next question I'm uh, speak, uh, asking on behalf of a student in ISB Mohali, and this again is his question, not mine. With the increasing number of, this is Pratik Munjal who wants to ask this question, with the increasing number of bad debts in the Indian market, 
do you think India can become the next big place for distressed debt investment firms in the lending sector? Uh, the question for those of you, if you haven't heard, is can India become a, a place where distressed debt firms uh, can can operate uh, and and make uh, you make know money. And, and do well and make money in the process and put put firms back on track? Absolutely. Uh, I think we need specialists, whether Indian or, or foreign, on uh, putting distressed assets back on track. If these specialists can bring in new money, because new money is needed to complete projects, uh, to provide the equity for that is missing in some of these projects, it will be very welcome. And so uh, it's not that India is for sale, but we need help okay. on project restructuring. We have our own asset reconstruction companies. We need to strengthen them with more capital action companies to come in. We're going to open the licensing process for new asset reconstruction companies of various hues mm -hmm. so that they can actually start helping us in bringing down the levels of distress. Okay. Uh, the next question is somebody in ISB Hyderabad, Malavika. So, uh, do you think the growth rate that our Prime Minister is working towards is feasible given um, our macroeconomic fundamentals? Also, what is the way ahead in terms of policy for sustainable growth? Okay, so I, 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 uh, these are all good questions, but uh, they're very pointed and, uh, and loaded sometimes. But, and, uh, but the credit goes to ISB. Mikey would, 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 uh, would ask me, and I suspect you're handing this because you're yeah. selecting the questions. <laughs> no, no, but I, 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 think, I think, Governor, you must give credit where it's due. It's credit is due to ISB, so no, I think no, we have to give credit I to mean, them. I, look, I, I have great respect for the intellect uh, <laughs> of students at ISB, having taught them in the past, so uh, no question there. But I'm also uh, wondering about the hidden hand. No, no, no <laughs> I'm completely innocent. Uh, Look, uh, uh, the Prime Minister has uh, an ambitious, uh, uh, ambitious uh, agenda for India. I just was in Washington where everybody is talking about the buzz he's left behind in the United States uh, amongst investors, amongst, uh, amongst the public. So I think that's all very good. Uh, and of course now uh, the level of expectations is very high and we have to match it. Uh, my sense is that without, uh, um, you know, thinking uh, about uh, major reforms of our system, that uh, doing the implementation, uh, doing the plans, finishing off the plans we promised, uh, we can put the economy back on track to a reasonable level of growth. So, you know, we are hoping five and a half this year, maybe a little more. Uh, then into next year, we go into the sixes and hopefully the sevens the year after. But to sustain that and to take it to a higher plane, we will have to think of how we reform the system fundamentally. And this means, I think, what the government is focusing on, things like how do we improve the framework for doing business? How do we make it easier for one of you to go out and become an entrepreneur and employ 30 people without spending your whole life in paperwork and dealing with inspectors who show up to, you know, uh, to ask you whether you're, you're meeting all the regulations? So we need to make it easy for business to grow. Uh, and that means finance, that means uh, uh, regulations, uh, that means uh, skilled labor. Uh, and I think the government is working on all these tracks and is starting by you know, trying to see what it can clear up. You will see the plans announced over time. And my sense is if we do this and we you know, upscale the whole thing, I don't see why we can't over time reach double digits, which is where we should be given uh, our you know, level of development. Okay, you spoke about entrepreneurship and the next question is about entrepreneurship and finance. So, Palani Kumar. Startup companies generally need a lot of finance and then banks are not supporting them because they don't have a heavy balance sheet and other things. Can you think of a special package which can be called out and then they being supported? Yeah. Um
the question is can we think of a special package to support startups and small and medium enterprise now i'll tell you my uh, what I, what i think is appropriate that of course small and medium and enterprise are worth supporting not for the traditional reason that people say which is in fact i think in many places wrong traditional reason people say is because these are the employers in the country the truth is small and medium enterprise are really good because they grow and therefore employ many more so the infosys which becomes the infosys of today is creating a lot for employment but the infosys of 1982 84 if it stayed at that size in 1982 84 would not be creating much employment so it's it's about growing small and medium enterprises into big enterprises which is where the employment benefit really is it's not yes uh, small and medium enterprises are employment intensive but it's really about the ones that grow big that create the the addition to employment now everybody wants a package so the question is can we as a country afford to subsidize everything and you have to ask yourself who's doing the subsidy then if everybody is getting subsidized who's providing the subsidy uh truth is it's better to create a better environment easier access to credit because we've improved the information structure we've uh track your credit quality if you default there's an easy bankruptcy process which allows your asset to be put back to better use we allow your asset to be seized paradoxically as it may seem it's easy to get credit if your asset can be seized and repossessed by the lender because then the lender is confident at least of getting some of his money back when he lends to you and therefore is willing to charge a lower interest rate it's the frameworks that we have to improve the environment we have to improve to my mind subsidy is a dead end that we cannot subsidize everybody and everybody wants subsidy how are we going to choose what is important and what what is unimportant everything is important might as well create a better environment so everybody has a chance and let the best win let us create that kind of structure so i i am not in favor of subsidy except to the very needy on a very targeted basis well the next question is linked to something that's very close to your heart financial inclusion vishnu rajan wants to ask you something about rural payments and e-commerce Good afternoon. India is predominantly a cash-based economy, since most of rural transactions take place in cash. Uh, that would create problems in accountability. How do we resolve it? And would creation of more banks ease this problem because of more e-payments? Uh, very good question. I was uh, having uh, uh, lunch with the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Uh, as you know, Kenya has a fantastic payment system called M-Pesa. which many others have tried to study to understand how it works we are on our way to creating a payment system slightly different because there are some issues on security which we differ from them we will create a slightly different template but we want to try and emulate their success by easing the way for mobile companies to uh help close the last mile uh and to help provide cash and cash out transactions So it should be possible going forward once we license these payment banks which we hope to do over the next few months uh for you to go to say a kiosk of a mobile company and there put your money to the kiosk there are 100000 such kiosks around the country put your money into the uh bank account that you have a line from the mobile company to your bank account in say state bank of india and that money gets paid in that state bank of india perhaps on the basis of the sink can offer you a loan through the mobile company agent uh that you can send remittances through the mobile company to somebody else that we basically connect up all the uh excluded uh through this process of e payments mobile payments uh we want to let many different varieties of forms emerge so that ultimately something uh um uh, sort of vibrant uh, comes through so the idea is absolutely do something like this uh connect up the indians who are excluded uh do the last mile uh so that we don't need a branch in every village but we have the ability to do banking services in every village